What? What? I can't see anything. I have your eyes now, Arthur. Some things are best left alone. Shut the book! Shut the book! Your partner is dead, and we need to hide the body now. I can hear something moving in the back. I don't think we're alone here. What are you doing? You're killing him. You're killing him. <laughs> what are you? But I call it love. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the malevolent Q and A. I hope you're excited to be kicking off another Invictus Con. I know I'm incredibly excited to be here. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Ren. I'm an author, fan of all things Invictus, and excited to be hosting all the panels for Invictus Con this year, starting with this fourth annual Malevolent Q and A uh, with the lore master who holds all the answers, including the name of the podcast recently remembered. <laughs> Mr. Harlan Guthrie. Harlan. I'm not controlling the sound effects, I swear. That wasn't a pause just for me. <laughs> no, no. It came from, from uh, wherever John comes from. Yeah. On a scale of 1 to 10, Harlan, how sleep deprived are you right now? Whoa. Uh, I'm okay. I'm like a f uh, th uh, 2. I'm a 3. I'm a 3. <laughs> it was an easy Perfect. morning and then annoying. It's like coming down uh it's it's really snowing around here in canada so it's very frustrating and we had to go out to our son's science fair so i feel ready to get comfy and cozy up with my friends and you uh my friend and uh, answer some questions you're also, enemy for doing this by the way for all this oh of course really fun. uh this is gonna be a lot of fun uh before we launch into it i want to tell the audience about a new bit we're introducing to the q a this year called eight ball Patrons, don't get excited. It's not that kind of eight ball. <laughs> uh, sometimes there are questions that Harlan either can't answer because of spoilers or would rather leave it up to the listener to decide. But instead of just answering with something like wait and see, no shade to Neil Gaiman, we will be consulting the eight ball for an answer instead. And we'll see what the eight ball has to say when we get there. Do I give a sample now? I think leave it. I think leave okay. it as a surprise. Done. By the way, you look really cool. And oh. people are saying it. And I need you to know too. Yeah. <laughs> you look stylish. Style. Style. You look cool. Stylish. Riz. <laughs> stylish. You look stylish. All right. Without further ado, let's get into it. Um, our first question is from Roanoke, who says, now that season four is complete, has the story arc for the season gone as you anticipated it would in the beginning? Were there things that really surprised you uh, about the story direction in season four as you wrote it, or did it mostly follow your expectations? Whoa, good question, Roanoke. Uh, okay, starting off with a biggie. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think more or less, I knew what I wanted to achieve vibe-wise with season four. So that obviously clicked. Story-wise, though, I think with most things, I didn't really know what I wanted to accomplish. Oh, here's the... Look at this. Thank you, uh, Fish, for doing that. Yes, thank you, Fish. Shout out, Fish. Uh, shout out, Fish! Um, yeah, definitely. So first off, has it gone as I anticipated? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Definitely season four was less gross eldritch horror than i had wanted uh in terms of the overall show but in terms of seasons four specific uh attempt at trying a different vibe i think it nailed it were the things that really surprised me about the story direction in season four as i wrote it um yeah i think i was pretty surprised at some of the characters at a how much the audience attached to them and and b how uh, well they fit in to the tapestry of Arthur's life. Uh, you know, you think, here's this character, Arthur, really larger than life. You know, he could fight a gug in the in the mountain halls of some dreamlands, but can kind of feel normal sitting across the table from a detective in, in New York. 
which I really liked. I thought that was really, really cool. And playing off those characters was something, you know, as a writer, but also as a enjoyer of Arthur's story that I was really excited to see. So I think that was really surprising that mm. I could make characters that are secondary that felt uh, like they were just as important as some of the main characters in the story. Awesome. Um, next question, Graham asks, as they grow and change, what part of Arthur and John's dynamic has been the most fun to write? <sighs> the most fun to write? Um, hmm. I would probably say uh, that the fights are the most fun to write because less so in season four because I was trying to accomplish a, a, a very focused perspective to a degree on Arthur's experience in the world, which is why, you know, Element and John get a little bit uh, tested in season four. But I really enjoy the fights because I like seeing things from both perspectives. And I would say 99% of the time, I kind of agree with both things, you know, even if you kind of have to change your mindset to be a little bit more innocent or juvenile or petulant to kind of get into the mindset of one or the other uh once you're in there it's fun to kind of make both cases uh somewhat equal yeah absolutely there's one Listen, there's never like a no one winner in an argument most of the time and they're so subjective you really get deep into their yeah. their psyches there's something coming up the patrons have already heard it that uh, arthur's making his case and he says he would never have done something when in the Q and A that we uh, had, that's going to be going public after Intermezzo. You were like, "No, he absolutely would have done that." Yeah, and I absolutely. loved, like, you know, seeing that when you're in a fight, you're so subjective. You have no like understanding of yourself. You're just fighting. Oh, hundred percent. And I think both these characters sometimes, you know, yeah, they just fight for without really understanding what their end goal is. They're just kind of making the point. And sometimes that's just the person that they are you know it's like well this has to be said whether or not i agree with it i don't know like the number of times john will say something where it's like are you sure about that and it's like well even john would be sure about that but he's like it has to be the counterpoint to everything and to me that feels very honest you know like if arthur was like well what do you mean well, what's your solution to this he'd be like oh I, I don't know but i feel like that you know like it's just it's kind of a very true truism i suppose Absolutely. So divorce enjoyer Harlan Guthrie. We, I mean, you... for real life as well. No, but I think <laughs> I think there is. This is previous. Me and Joe are fine. <laughs> but uh, I think there has been a uh, yeah. Like I, I think less less so divorce arc because I know a lot of people say that they're kind of like oh divorce arc here incoming and whatnot. I think it's more communication. Like I think those who struggle with communication or sometimes communicate ineffectually recognize that half the time you're just trying to get an idea out, even if you don't always say the right thing. And to me, that feels very true to life. And as much as malevolent is big and crazy and expansive at times, I do try to make elements, at least in the dialogue, feel like that's kind of the approach they would do. And I think that sometimes loses people when they're kind of like, well, why would John say that? It's like, well, because I feel like that's kind of what you do when you're backed into a corner. And that's something Arthur would say to twist the knife, even if he doesn't necessarily believe it, because it's kind of true. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, next question. Heavenly BB and Cap both asked about the voters. Uh, do we as the voices play any significant role in Arthur's uniqueness, aside from how we can choose which direction the narrative goes? Do the viewers have a bigger role in the lore than making choices for Arthur? So I can use these eight ball answers anytime I want, right? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Uh, here you go. Here's our first, here, we're, we're consulting the eight ball. He's dead. <laughs> There's your answer for the eight ball. There's your answer. <laughs> He's dead, next question. <laughs> next question, Tegan asks, I've seen a lot of authors immediately wanting to get rid of something. Either it messed up the timeline or it, it uh, just feel, it didn't make sense. Have you ever regretted bringing in a certain character or scene? Oh, that's an interesting question. I know. Yeah, probably. Probably, yeah. Have I ever regretted bringing in a certain character? Yes. I, I know I have. And then I think I either changed them to like them more or found a place to make them more meaningful and i think i think oscar might have been one at first 
No, it wasn't Oscar. Who the heck was it? There was a character that I brought in and I was kind of like, oh. No, it was in season three. Oh, it was the guy in the bar in, in the... season three. Yeah, I forget what his name was. I, it's not that I didn't like him, but I regretted that that scene came with Yellow and Arthur rather than John and Arthur because it felt like something that I can't really refer back to now oh, because only yeah. Arthur has experienced it. And he could, but it would be, it'd be, it'd be bad writing to be like, well, I was in a bar once and I met this guy and he said this thing. It just, it was just like kind of hokey to do it that way. Right. Uh, and I just wished I was kind of like, man, that that's a cool, it had to come there and I'm glad it came, but I guess I regretted that it, it fell there and not at a time because you only get so many chances with like, that type of thing. And that's the one thing I'm realizing entering season five now is that you only get one or two chances to do something, some idea, you know, and there's a few double beats that happen in season five. You know, season five is sort of similar to season three beginning and patrons know why and soon you'll find out. Um, and I recognize as I was writing that I wanted to change it, but that I was like, oh, I, I, I couldn't do that again even if I wanted to because it's it's meant to be a parallel, but I also can't you know, and there's a few characters. The lighthouse keeper is one. That guy mm. is one. That kind of monologue with a like a wistful, almost like an elegance, where they sort of talk about these grandiose things. And I was a little bit remiss that it wasn't one that I could refer back to both of them experiencing. Great answer. Thank you. Anonymous and Claire eighty nine both asked, "How do you learn or practice the different voices? Any advice on?" future voice for future voice actors to improve on different accents and dialects uh how do i learn uh practice i don't i mean i don't i just i just kind of wing it i mean literally half the time i it, i'll just do it kind of in the booth or during recording uh, booth being my closet or i'll just kind of be like ah, that's kind of a new voice like for instance the uh now famous I don't even remember the character's name with the mask, the one who sounds like Werner Herzog. I oh, was just yeah. like trying to find another, what's his name? Vizier. Yep. Uh, who I was trying to find something I hadn't done before. And I was like, oh, I do kind of want to like a, do a German dialect type thing. But I was like, you can't really do that with that. I was like, oh, but wait a minute. There's like, Werner Herzog is like the perfect version of that. So I was like, I'll just try to emulate that. And it took a lot to do that one, to be honest. Like I couldn't just go into it especially after recording everyone else because i record you know, all of john all of arthur and then whoever else is in the episode i usually just pick what's hardest and do it last um so my voice doesn't get shredded mm. but yeah i would say in terms of learning and practicing i kind of just yeah I go on a whim i mean that won't always be the case by season six i'm sure my my pool of voices will be very very slim at which point i might have to be practicing but uh i think i just write with intent and that kind of helps me frame the the meter, maybe. And then the rest is kind of, is just, you know, going on fun. But in terms of advice and improving your different accents, I mean, Joe, Henry, even Marie, even though she's five months old, uh, will all attest to me constantly going into different accents around the house just for fun because I enjoy it. So I would say in terms of improving have fun with it and be really uh annoying to your family is what i'll say for humility's sake but i know they do like it uh you know cook dinner in a scottish accent even if it's terrible because by the end you'll be more familiar with what you're doing and uh and it's and it's just a and it's a fun way to to annoy your family yeah be cool for your family very cool so cool coolest dad ever joe just commented he's wonderful we love it see i, there you I go. know <laughs> Yeah, you have to listen to Joe. I do. Uh, Foxglove Dreams and Kathleen both asked, how did you go about settling on a deranged cackle for Kane? How long did it take to pin down a version you were satisfied with? And were there any laughs from film or TV that you drew inspiration from? <laughs> it's really interesting. It makes me feel, I don't know, for some re reason weird. But no, there, there was no... It makes me feel like a hack, to be honest. That there was no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't rehearse it. I, I just thought, I don't know. I just laughed. 
I don't know. I just felt, I think I just pushed it a lot. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I wish I had a more intelligent answer because this yeah. is the kind of thing that as a viewer, you know, uh, you see Mark Hamill be like, well, here's how I did the Joker's laugh. And for me to not put that forethought for some reason doesn't make me feel better. It makes me feel like, oh, I should have. But no, I, I think I just, you know, deranged cackle is, is what I was like. Oh, he'd probably laugh derangedly. And I just went for it. And it was fun. So to how long to pin it down? The satisfied? I mean, <laughs> again, I think it was one It was one take. I was like, this will, this will be what Kane's. And I, I think I need to stress this. Not... Not many people. Very few voice actors are the ones writing their characters. And I think I have a very unique, privileged perspective when writing these characters because I knew, and, and I'm a very visual writer. I, I I could picture Kane, you know, sitting at the piano, bloody footprints, you know, in this black suit with muddy elbows. And I knew the vibe. So when I was writing it, I, and again, people walking through the house will attest to it. You know, I usually am saying the words out loud. And and maybe that's even a better answer to the previous question too, because maybe I'm testing the voices as I'm kind of talking a little bit, you know, because like when I was writing Kane, I'd be like, oh, no, no, no. oh ha, ha. you know, I, I kind of like be doing that work there. So you know what? That's probably a more honest answer. Now that I think about it, that makes more sense too. So I think I'm, I'm doing it in the writing because a lot of these amazing voice actors that are getting these scripts, you know, they get the freedom to invent and that's their fun. And I get to do that while I'm writing them, which kind of eliminates the after work of it. So, so in, during, in pinning down a version in the writing, yeah, I think I, I kind of, I wrote and rewrote, I suppose, you know, backspace and started writing again until I felt like, oh yeah, this is the kind of character that I want to portray in this scene. <clears throat> um, was I inspired by any film or TV? Uh, yeah, I would say visually, I was very much inspired by Peter Stormare in, oh my God, not Hellblazer. What the hell is it called? Um, you know. should know. It's that Keanu Reeves movie. It's based on the comic. Oh, oh Constantine? Constantine, thank you. I was very much inspired by Peter Stormare and Constantine because he mm. plays the devil and the very end he comes down i always thought it was so fucking cool and he comes down and his feet are like black and they're but not black they're like dripped in oil almost and i thought what a cool depiction of the devil and he's wearing a white suit and i was like what a fucking metal depiction honestly the only thing i didn't like is he's got kind of like tattoos that are like looking up i was like eh. but everything else about peter stormer's depiction of the devil and constantine was like 10 out of 10 i was like so cool and i was like well, I got to kind of play with that. So instead of oil, it's blood. And instead of white, it's black. And and the head I never really pictured. But that that vibe was like, that's what I want to kind of emulate. Because it's menacing, but like quirky. Especially with Peter Stormer. Like, why pick Peter oh, yeah. Stormer? Like, he's so cool. Like, and again, menacing, right? Like Fargo. He's got this like unhinged vibe to him visually. Mm -hmm. too. But anyway, so there you go. There, there That's where I was right down uh in in terms of inspiration awesome next question cryptid asks you said that if john had a birthday it would be june 3rd may we please know what would be yellow's birthday the answer to this is that's perfect perfect thank you eight <laughs> ball <laughs> <laughs> sorry cryptid next question uh Thais says, as far as I understand it, while planning for chapters, you have two planned paths and the voters pick one. But while we decide on which path to pick in our endless discussions, have you heard the patrons say something that's so comedic or outlandish or imaginative that it made you partially or even completely change the original idea that you had for a given path? Mm. Yes. Yes, I do. There, there was, there have been, I'd say, two or three points where an idea that someone was kind of pitching as a potential was like, oh, that's really cool. Never like a whole swap, but like an idea if X, then Z, because it's, you know, patrons have a lot of great ideas. I mean, it would be silly to be like, oh, no, I, you know, no art inspires 
malevolent, no movies, and therefore no feedback or thoughts from the patrons inspire malevolent whatsoever. Like there's there's definitely a rundown. I can't recall any specifics, unfortunately, because it was never so much to be like, hey, you know, Abriel Scrap called it this week. I really yeah, like, you know, it's gotta it's gotta be kind of a smaller thing anyway. And yeah. again, at this point, you know, to put it in perspective, I've done well, I guess not 200, but uh, many, many, many choices in the show, you know, enough to start forgetting a lot of them. Uh, but yeah, I would say two or three times, two or three out of 200, so, or less than 200, but two or three times. So don't worry about being like, oh, I'll give Harlan a cool idea. I think more, more so it's kind of, usually the stuff I pick up on is, or would be excited about would be like quirky stuff, not mm. like oh, that's a better this, but more like, a, oh man, that would be interesting to see him fall off of this. I, I, <laughs> I got to be careful because I was about to reference something that's only patron specific. I was about to reference something too. I wonder if it was the same thing. <laughs> it might've been actually. Um, but yeah, so so definitely definitely little things here or there, but I would say maybe two or three times. I wish I could, yeah. I wish I could think, but yeah, no, I wouldn't say not completely change my idea. I would say, yeah, maybe partially. Okay. But, yeah. Awesome. Seder asks, as a creator with an active fan base, how do you go about interacting with fan content while remaining impartial slash uninfluenced in your own storytelling? So this is a great kind of follow up to that. Uh, yeah, very interesting. So I've definitely, and I think most people will attest to, I've definitely pulled back from the fan interaction as of late for many reasons. It's been, it's been kind of tough there's a lot of positive out there there's a lot of negative that's just kind of a, a, a you know a fallout of um, having a popular show it's, it's a privilege to have so many people wanting to listen and I genuinely love it I'm very very blessed for that yeah with the uh, content though like yeah. I, I I thought this question was interesting because I struggle myself sometimes of like I, sometimes you don't want to be influenced by outside stuff. Sometimes you yeah. just want to be like in your void, but then other times like with Constantine, you really want to be pulling from the cool stuff that you've absorbed mm. in your life. Yeah. And do you feel pulled towards fan content sometimes more than others? I mean, hands down art. Absolutely. Like all of the art that like Peppers and Danny and, you know, uh, I mean, there's been a slew of amazing art I feel inspired and pulled to, but thankfully because the medium is literally on the opposite side, none of that. And most of the stuff they're drawing is like either happened or like right. kind of alternate universe stuff that, that will, will never really happen in malevolent. So I never feel like I'm influenced by it. And then in terms of the stories, I know there's tons and tons of like fan writing that has happened fanfics and stuff like that i haven't read a single one so in terms of that i just don't you know and i will say on record and i'll say it now uh because i think someone said it the other day that they thought i stole a fan art uh fanfic or something i will never read a fanfic and i have never for that exact reason i love i would i always gonna want plausible deniability to be like if it's happened it's it's a total coincidence because I don't want to invite, and it's funny because I even, I edited for the town whispers not too long ago, a year ago or whatever. And I remember at the same time, I was like, made it clear. I don't listen to other horror podcasts because I never want someone coming being like, Hey, I had that idea that you had. And I was like, no, I live in a bubble. Well, that's what it was. Someone on Reddit was like, malevolent sounds awfully like this other show on Q code where this person has a voice in their head. And I was like, honestly, I've never heard of it. I, I honestly, and then I looked up the date and I made Malevolent first. And I was like, well, there you go. <laughs> it's like, like that's, it's not, not to say that I'm like, oh, I have the original idea, but I, I promise I did not, uh, didn't listen to that and go, well, I could do that. So <clears throat> story-wise, I stay away from all of that, uh, fully interact with pictures. And that's how I remain impartial. I stay ignorant. Great. Perfect. Ignorance is bliss. Yes, definitely. K KM asks, um, what is a fan project you would love to see? Something like a group quilt or a board game or card games. As you know, your fans are just absolutely crazy creative and love doing oh fan God. projects. KM, that's my favorite question so far because I am really bad at like 
wanting to buy stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like I like KM and a ton of people put together a fucking gorgeous um fanzine. Immediately I, I bought it. I was like, need that. And uh be, and and they sent some stickers and some like keychains and stuff. Man, I, I know the tarot deck is coming out, which I'm a yes. thousand percent gonna buy. I'm gonna probably buy two of them. And uh if not more. I like I'm such a sucker for that normally. You know, like I, I, I've backed Kickstarters for like Eldritch playing cards. You know what I mean? Like I'm that kind of person. Yeah. So, you know, anything malevolent, I'm like, yeah, fucking please, man. What would I like though? Like, oh fuck, group quilt. I don't know what that. I mean, I'm assuming your physical quilt. No board game. I mean, I don't play card games. Board game would be amazing. Yeah. Oh, minis. What about minis? Yeah, minis would be cool, but like they're to get. Like, that would be a high level. Of, like, you'd have to really do that. Man, I, what would I want? Oh, fuck. Uh, quick answer, because I know you said three minutes yep. per. Um, 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 um. Uh, like, art. So, like, I literally bought, I have sitting next to me, uh, uh, oh, you can kind of see it. This piece by Gabby Billings on Instagram, who uh, drew the uh, Sleeping City from season one. And I bought it instantly. I was like, I, that, I, I want that so badly. Oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. Uh, I don't know. Maps would be so cool. But then see, now I feel obligated for like Rob to do a map, like Addison, because that that should be something, even if, I mean, I don't make anything on art and he doesn't either He because he gets most of the commissions for the art. But like, it would be nice to to have people get it officially. So I kind of feel weird about that, but I would love that. I don't know. I'll think and come back. Yeah. Someone put some ideas so I can steal because I'm totally into, like board game would be, yes. Short answer is board game. Okay, okay. We'll come back to it, though. Yes, uh, Death Note answer. asks, uh, will there be more non-canon specials in the future? Um, I don't know. Probably not. Consult the 8-ball. Consult the 8-ball. No, because I do want to answer this one, honestly, because I think it's important for people to understand if there isn't one. Mm. Similarly to, like, jokes that or that I mentioned earlier or whatever, like, you can't do things too many times. I'm not, it's not going to be a yearly special for sure. If I madly whip one out, you know, two years from now, maybe, but put it this way, I will say this. I am very much a a writer when it comes to things that are outside of my like day to day, I have to get this done. That only works when they feel inspired. Like for those who have listened to Divisor, Divisor literally came because I was driving home and being like, oh, here's an idea. And it spiraled. And that night I had the pilot. Like I was like, it, you know, strike while the iron is hot type creative personality. So I will say this. Benevolent was exactly that. I was like, man, I want to do this. Like I was watching a bunch of Christmas movies, like Bing Crosby specials. And I was like, I want to just do that. So if I do another one, it'll be because I feel like it. And it's the same with the eight balls. Like I, they're only fun when I get fucking fun doing them. If, if it becomes a thing that's like starting to be expected, other than the extra life rewards, obviously, um, then it, it's just less fun. So I will say there may very well be, but to make Ren happy, I'll press an eight ball. Not in this timeline. <laughs> there you go. Maybe a different. There you time. go. <laughs> okay, uh, we're gonna pivot to a new segment now called Rapid Fire Round. Ooh. Rules are simple. I'm gonna pepper you with questions, and you have to answer as quickly as possible. First thing off the dome. Oh no, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh Nova asks, if you were to have malevolent produced in any other medium, what would it be? Example animated TV show. Uh live action movie. Anonymous asks, would John like Electro Swing? No. I don't know what that is. Oh, can I press eight ball for these? You can yes, you can press eight ball for these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's an eight ball. Okay. Whatever, whatever it was. Okay, I'll press an eight ball. Hold on. Yes but only in the dark world. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Positive, Normal Danny and DJ all asked, why did you pick Peggy Gordon in particular for the Butcher's favorite song? Oh, um, uh, a film called The Proposition. Sandra, if is there a chance of you releasing a Peggy Gordon cover as the Butcher? Yes. Marimo, Malevolent gets turned into a TV series. Who composes the music uh, if you couldn't do it yourself? Me. Uh, I would force myself. I wouldn't sign off unless I could do it. Mm. Okay, no, no. A better answer would be, oh, god damn it. What's his name? 
Oh, he's one of my favorite composers. He did the music for No Country Old Men, despite there not being any music. Oh my God, him. Okay. Um, a Quiet Violet asks, um, Fish, move your, okay. <laughs> Fish is in the same document as me and sometimes I can't see the question. Do you That's ever fair. share maps of your old COC games? I'm dying to know what Anna's house looks like. Carter Burwell, by the way, for the previous question. Um, Anna's house didn't have a map, I don't think. Oh, just a shout out, I do. And the map was using Mansions of Madness tiles. Oh, nice. That's so cool. Anonymous, what's your favorite Arthur headcanon? I don't know any. Himmy, if they were to play D&D, &D, what classes would Arthur and John play? Arthur would be a, um, a really bad rogue. And John would be a paladin. I was hoping that John would stay paladin from the last time somebody asked you that. Was question. he paladin last time too? Yeah. What did I say Arthur was last time? I think you said something like a bad rogue. The bard yeah, might have been mentioned, but I think, no, I think you said that. I think the answer is. What if I said the same thing? Someone from the consistent. Same thing. No, but I like that. Anyway, I'm not going to get off track. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Graham asked uh, Is Anna alive and do you have plans for her in the future? Redconned. <laughs> Piper, on a scale of one to ten, how excited uh, are you about the end game? Five. Mm. And Dippity, last question of the lightning round. Are you having fun? Yes, definitely. <laughs> and I just, I know it's lightning, but I want to say five because it's a ten for the end game, but five because then it's over. Like, like uh, or one because it's over. Like, it's not content wise, it's a 15. But the fact that Malevolent might be ending is a negative five. So, yeah. Uh, anytime somebody mentions in the Discord that Malevolent will end someday, <laughs> people are just like, no, we're not, we don't talk about that. Yeah. We don't talk about that here. It's like that, that image. We don't, yes. Okay. Uh, on to some longer form questions again. And, uh, as a reminder, eight ball always on the table. Seer of Time asks, what has season four slash intermezzo taught you the most? Man, uh, what has it taught me the most? I would say during season four, I learned to really just trust my own instincts. I think as the, as the, I'll say this, I'm really, really proud of the season four finale and i went into the season four finale with nothing in terms of like how i wanted to do it i knew i i knew i wanted them at the order and that i wanted to close up ties that's it and i think by the end of that episode i accomplished not only everything i wanted to do but i think oh sorry i should put this question on screen but i think not to pat myself on the back but i think i nailed it in terms of those story arcs being where I where I wanted them. Some people were like, well, this is left on a hook. That was purposeful. So that's what I learned. And I think a lot of people, especially around like the farm arc, uh, I saw a lot of negativity being like, oh, he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. And 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 all through that, I I I had a plan and I knew what I'm doing and I stuck to my guns. And I'm gonna continue sticking to my guns. And there's still people out there being like, well, what was the point of this? And I, I, you know, I just, it's tough to be like, well, just fucking wait. Like, <laughs> you know, but I think at, at the end of it, what I really learned at the end of season four was like, uh, you know what? I, I got this by now. Like, I, I don't need people who think that they can do better than me to make me feel like I'm doing a terrible job because I think I, I think I am doing a good job. So I, I felt really confident uh, in the end of season four. Um that I I can tell this story, I guess, mm. you know, and I think that's one of the the difficulties of a growing fandom. Yeah, very quickly, very vocal fans think they can do it better than you, and it's absolutely true. I've seen people outright say it. <laughs> uh, oh, fandom. Hey, okay, it's Ace, life. yeah. Ace asks. The patrons have a lot of influence over Arthur's actions and decisions, but Arthur's still undeniably his own independent character. What mm -hmm. character traits do you consider to be integral to keep in mind when writing Arthur? 
Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. I think when it comes to the main characters, I don't normally like, I don't have a character sheet of things to follow. So I, because I write them very in terms of just like feeling, excuse me. Um, but I would say Arthur is very strong willed. I would say he is somebody who always feels like he uh, has to be doing better or at least appearing to be doing better. I think he's somebody that has a great deal of regret and has grown to move past that and to forgive himself and to forgive others. And I think he's somebody that's trying to work on making that more present in his interactions as well. You know, I, I think he's a pretty honorable person in the most part, for the most part. And I think he's neutral good, if I was to use the alignment chart. I mean, obviously, every character does some truly terrible things uh, at one time or another. But I think Arthur, between the two, I think Arthur is always meant to be more of the lawful. And John is meant to be more of the evil. And they both have secondary characteristics that sway. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Seder and Pinch of Peppers both ask, um, how do you go about planning for and preparing for either a temporary, like a season finale, end, or a permanent end, like the series finale? Do you have an idea for the ending of Malo Did you have an an idea for the ending of Malevolent before you published the first episode or did it gradually come to you? No, even now I don't have an ending in mind. I know what I want to do in the sixth season. I know how I want it structured and I kind of know what the main like thing is going to be. Uh, but in terms of how it's going to end, yeah, I have no, no fucking idea yet. Uh, and it was the same going into season four. I was like, and just to put it in perspective, Going to season four, the train, I was like, I know I want them to end up at this place. And I know I want to introduce redacted, redacted, and redacted. Uh, and that's not just, that's for patrons too. Um, but, uh, and I know I want them to end up in redacted. Patrons know about that. Uh, but beyond that, everything else was like, well, how am I going to get there and how am I going to do it? And some stuff comes up, you know, near the end. And and you're kind of like, oh, I know what I want to do. Next season, I want to do this. So I'll introduce this. And and sometimes it's it's convenient seeds that I've already planted. Then I'm like, oh, that's perfect. That will make sense and connect to that. But sometimes they're long-awaited seeds that I'm finally getting to cut down because they've grown. Yes. Uh, so, no, I have no idea for the ending yet. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to do with the season finale yet. Awesome. Cryptid and Vile Decrepit Kidney both want to know about Yellow, our boy Yellow. Uh, what was the thought process when making Yellow as a character? Did you plan to include Yellow in the plot or did you come up with him after the tie in part 20? Uh, did you skip a question? Fish, uh, Fish wrote a different question. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, I did. Okay, no worries. Um, I will say this about the Yellow question. Once I reread it, because I was reading Fish's oh, question sorry. while you're saying sorry. that, I'm confused. No, no, it's okay. Sorry. And it was about yellow. Uh, yeah. Thought process when making yellow. Did you come up with, um, yeah, come up with him after the tie in part twenty? Oh, yeah. It definitely kind of came up with him in turn. Like, I, I sometimes there's an idea so good that you're just like, oh, I want to run with that. And I, I, I remember when I was writing uh, Coda, going to Joe, who's always the person I like run with my stupid ideas with, and being like, what if, what if Kane's offer was to wipe, you know, and just lose it, and now everything is reset? And, you know, the excitement of me, me pitching it, she already knows. She's like, well, yeah, obviously that's the thing you want to do because it's so exciting. And then there's always the questions, well, what do, like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And the fun of this show is me being like, I'll figure it out. Like, it's okay. It's okay. Like, that's the fun. Because A, that's the, like the GM in me being like, who fucking cares? It's a show. We'll figure it out. But also, that's like how I get inspired to continue writing. Like, prime example, and I don't think I've ever said this one. When Arthur 
was so the the the, the mines under Larson's house were like probably my first major roadblock after John came back and they fell down that hole I was like it was my it was my second major roadblock the first major roadblock is how Kane was birthed the second major roadblock was what the fuck do I do once they get to the caves and I was like this close to pressing send on Arthur falling down that hole and breaking both of his legs and like totally changing the dynamic of like how they do this and then like just like it got so weird and then the second thing was like in those caves it got so weird like just a lot of things were different <laughs> <laughs> and i didn't go that route and i'm glad i didn't because but it would have been very very different season three had i been like whatever let's just do it i kind of was like ah, i'll stay the course for now and see where it goes which is i think honestly why season three is shorter too um besides some major decisions that was one thing but uh, no the long and short of it is no yellow uh was not planned but once i started following through with the initial exciting idea you know uh i realized well that's the logical choice i'm still a bit confused why people attach to yellow at all really i mean i get it from arthur's perspective i can reason it from arthur's perspective and i can write it from arthur's perspective that's why episode 40 has his kind of come to god moment with all that but uh, but for as me as a listener and writer i don't i don't get it but that's okay that's how people enjoy media um but yeah no he was he was definitely randomly not randomly i would say logically came up with because when you follow that instance through and and yeah i would say every season at least has one moment where i'm like oh here's a fucking cool idea I'm just going to run with it and see what happens. And sometimes it comes out to be the best thing I ever did. And sometimes it's like, uh. another example is the butcher POV switch. Came ah, into yeah. Joe, uh, uh, Joe's room, and, or uh, not Joe's room, I think the baby's room, or whatever time it was, she was napping. And I was like, what if I just do this episode in a different perspective? You know what I mean? And it's always about that exciting idea. And if, if I'm excited about that, then I'll figure the rest out. Mm -hmm. DJ asks, uh, I commend you for being able to discuss difficult topics like childhood trauma and child abuse. Your ability to write flawed characters is amazing. How do you get the confidence to talk about topics like that without overthinking your choices or trying to forgive a character's actions guided by their trauma? Example, Arthur uh, slapping that guy in the mines or the butcher being the butcher, John having killed Emily, etc. I think because, and I've said this before and I've had people disagree with me, but I think characters i think true to life characters and obviously these aren't true to life because they are larger than life but if i am to write a character that is meant to represent all of the ups and downs of humanity then in my opinion they are capable of everything they are capable of good and bad and triumph and disaster equally um i don't think there's any you know you you can choose to do good and you can accidentally do horrible evil and you can choose to do horrible evil and you can accidentally do good. And I think whether it's childhood trauma or abuse, uh, all of those choices are just aspects of humanity. And I don't think I treated them any more sensitively than I would anything else, not to diminish the impact, but to try and represent the fact that these things exist and can affect all of us regardless of who you are you know what i mean and i and i think it was an attempt to portray honesty in whatever way you want to view that you know and perhaps i'm the odd one in feeling that humans are capable of all nature of horrible things and that's what i thought in divisor <laughs> go look for that for further thoughts but you know i i, I think I think there's an earnestness in those depictions that I try to bring to Malevolent that I think most people understood. And I think this question might be understanding that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I talk about them with, with an earnestness without any sort of like, uh, you know, Arthur's not a psychiatrist. He didn't get to uh, filter through those ideas. He only can experience them. And by empathizing with people who do that, at the very least, I can write 
the idea of, you know, how he would explain those feelings, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's a tough thing to, to try to explain. Hopefully that gave a little bit of justice. Yeah, I think so. Grackle asks, though, DJ. yeah, it was, yeah, it's a very good question. Grackle asks, what is the process like of balancing between scenes of action and scenes that are more introspective or about establishing the relationships between the characters? Mm, that's a good question, actually. And that I would say is probably the most, I would say that's the biggest reason I ever do really revisions. It's like pacing. Like, mm. and again, to to speak to patrons for a second, like the opening of season five, you know, I, I knew all the things I wanted to do. Uh, and I was like, okay, well, but let's spread them out a little bit and let's make it feel less than you're just getting an exposition dump or whatever. And I think it's still something I'm learning. I don't think I'm perfect at it. I don't. I I knew very few people that are perfect at that kind of stuff. Um, honestly, for for something that is perfect at that, in my opinion, Joe and I just watched season two of The Bear. If you haven't seen The Bear, oh my god, I was gonna actually DM you about it. I was like, so good, so good. Not not only is it just, I mean, not only is it a great show and great acting and great, 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 but man, the writing of that show and the execution of it especially in there's one episode in season two not the one that most people would think i'm going to recommend not the family dinner one but there's a the, the episode after that called forks forks is it's just i would say it's like a master class in like pacing and and uh, from a writing standpoint it's just really really well done but the season season two especially is a master class in it is one of the, it's the first time i think i ever watching a show by the end i was like oh wow this season focused on every character in a way that didn't make it seem like, oh, you're watching this character's episode. episode. Like they have episodes like that, but it, it was just, it was, and I said it to Joe, it was just elegant. Elegant was the way I described the writing of, of, of the bear, especially season yeah. two. Very I felt elegant. like I so, learned as I, I felt like I learned <laughs> about writing while watching the show. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think what's, and what's so fucking elegant about it is that it's not, it's not a like a hoity toity show either. Like it's it's very mm -hmm. again, it's yes, it's a master class because it's also very earnest and there's lots of swearing and there's lots of messiness and you know, mm -hmm. like it's it's not it's not the kind of show you'd think is a master class in writing, you know, it's like a Tootsie where it's like, oh, this is just fucking good. Like mm -hmm. regardless of what the subject matter is, it's just really well done. So anyway, the long and short of it is the balancing between scenes and actions, I would say, yeah, it's still something I always try to strive for because Unfortunately, given the narrative I've chosen, it benefits me 99% of the time, but also sometimes I need to have exposition or I'm writing such intricate emotions that I need to then still slow the pace to kind of be like, and it's sometimes to the chagrin of many people that are listening, because I know oftentimes I hear more than anything, patrons being like, oh, just talk, you know, and I get it, but listen, now is not the time, guys. Like something else is going to happen, and if I just stop the action and have a long dialogue between John and Arthur, you may feel like that word got out, but it's going to be boring as fuck. <laughs> like, 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 so, I think I mean? that they should stop right where they where they are for for patrons in redacted where they are just. Stand yeah. there and hash it out for like never a good forty five minutes. I love. It. Well, but it's funny because that is the the biggest the biggest answer to when people say, "Oh, I wish these guys would talk," is because yeah, but that's boring. And honestly, it's a, that's a, that's an answer for a lot of things. I mean, I remember I don't get them anymore, but a lot of people early on would be like, "Oh my god, how is Arthur seeing? How is Arthur finding half the shit he's finding? John's not telling him to turn here and turn here." And I'm like, "Because that's fucking awful." Do you imagine listening to a show where? John was as detailed as he had to be to actually navigate Arthur. Arthur, okay, take five steps forward. Okay, stop. Extend your right hand. I'd be like, what is this yeah. shit? Like, it's a show. Like, <laughs> Before we were friends, I once asked you on Tumblr um, if they could read more of the books, and your answer was, no, that'd be fucking boring. <laughs> <laughs> that, was that you? That's funny. Yeah. That's good. Well, and the same thing. People are like, why don't they read the books? I'm like, listen. The, the books, unfortunately, only become relevant when it's important to plot because it's fucking boring. Again, like, you do want to really listen to people reading up. Like, they do it, and they do it when it's important. But other than that, it's just dumb, and no one uh, will do it. <laughs> I, I'm cut it from dice shame. I'm not going to put it in malevolent, you know? My God. Uh, all right. Um, last question of this before we move on to another rapid-fire round. Um, 
A Quiet Violet asks, in the season four Q&A, you emphasize overarching themes of self-determination and inventing slash reinventing oneself. You also reiterate the power of being seen. When you genu genuinely know who someone is, you know who slash what they are, such as Kane emphasizing his own identity. Could you mm. speak more about these themes? Yeah. I mean, I, and I, I think, oh, dang. Like intermezzo is the answer to this question, yeah. Because, and and patrons haven't uh, or patrons have listened to it yet, but I, I sort of have a thesis going on for identity in general. And you know, Arthur sees his name, you know, his identity in who he is as something that has had a lot of trauma and a lot of horror and a lot of terrible things that have happened to it. You know, that's that's who he is. You know, he is Arthur Lester. Like, it's not just a coincidence that John says his name so fucking much. And John equally got to choose his identity to a degree. And uh, there's a lot that I, I kind of enjoy looking at when we're talking about uh, who you are and who you get to choose to be. And I think this season, you know, touched on a lot of that. One being Arthur, you know, reconnecting with his father-in-law, you know, reinventing his relationship with him because he never really had a father figure and how he hated himself so much because of what happened with his daughter that he lost a potential, you know, relationship. And there's a scene in season two where we hear a flashback the first time we hear Daniel. Uh, and Daniel is kind of pompous and is kind of a jerk. And there's a reason that the King in Yellow is showcasing that scene to Arthur. And that's because that's how Arthur sees Daniel. But as we see in season four, that's not really Daniel. Daniel isn't, and it's really interesting. And, and I, I see how the community is kind of split on him. And I wish they were a little bit more, I wish they looked beyond just what I've shown you of the character to kind of follow through some of the, ideology that Daniel set forth you know Daniel's not the kind of guy he didn't scream get out of my house he literally left a, a note for Arthur at the hotel to be like hey come by and visit me like you know when you think about that mentality you know that's how the butcher ended up finding him but Daniel found out that Arthur was staying at this hotel didn't bang down the door didn't call the hotel room he left a note said Arthur if you stop by you know this is a three-dimensional guy Daniel is a person who's lost his daughter. He's lost his granddaughter and his son-in-law, you know, whether or not he blames him. And obviously he has some struggle. He left him alone. He's like, okay, fair enough. You want to move to Arkham? You want to do your own shit? Whatever. And I guess that idea of like having a fully fleshed out character that we only get to see a little bit of is, is something that I was really trying to touch on in season four to show that Arthur's not always right. And his decision to reinvent himself to be somebody who, yeah, maybe sees a father and maybe sees a mother and Marie and, you know, uh, gets to uh, explore what it feels like to finally be a part of something. These were all kind of the, the things that I was looking to touch on. Uh, but in terms of like, again, that self-identity, I think that's really crystallized by Intermezzo. So listen to that soon as well. Yes. Oh, it's so good. I'm so excited for that to drop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, after that meaty answer, it is time to cool off with another rapid fire round. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm born ready. <laughs> all right. Anonymous, Roanoke, Indrid, and Seer of Time all asked favorite noises slash sound effects to record or edit for season four specifically. Oh, my God. Uh, that can't be a quick question. Uh, okay, I'll uh, move next... it. I'll move it down. Okay, let me think okay. again. Yeah, yeah. Come okay. On. Uh, Anonymous, what's your least favorite scene you've had to record? Oh, least favorite? Yes, least favorite. Uh, bring it back again. <laughs> I mean, that's not a quick one. That's I so should not have given you this power. No, it's um, good. Keep going. Sorry. Eve asks, uh, the whole radio thing with John seemed to mostly disappear later into the series. Will that ever come back as part of the mystery? He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> He's dead. Uh, the tree, you know of AUs in the same vein as Ferroverse. What do you think about the fandom made King and Yellow Fragments for other characters? Don't know any of them. I only know Ferroverse by name. 
funny. I'm assuming yeah. what Furrowverse is. It's right. it's, it's a version where Furrow lives. Something and she's like the that. main character. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anonymous, what made you choose King in Yellow as the origin of the entity? Uh, uh legally safe. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the tree that I do. Uh, the tree minus the whole killing him thing. Do you think John and Parker would get along? No. Daisy, what do you believe is the most misunderstood part of malevolent? Oh, I mean the the relationship between John and Arthur. Right. Yep. Yeah. Lambda, is there anything you say or do at this at the start of a recording session to get into character? Oh yeah, I usually breathe as Arthur when I'm recording. I'll go. <sighs> And you can, and, and I hate to do this because it just makes me sound like an asshole. But like, if you if you go back and you listen to a bunch of the chapters, sixty percent of them start off with, "Okay, listen." And it's like so most grounding. of the time, I cut it when I do a, a thing. But it, it's a, it's a breath for Arthur. Yeah, you uh, you said that in a Q and A maybe last year or two years ago, and ever since then, I do listen for it, but it. I, I because I it. became self aware and now I'm like I start cutting it because but if you, I would say if you listen to like chapters 100 and previous it, mm -hmm. it'd be in there. It's it's nice. I don't know. It I just folded it into my understanding of the character. Well, that's um, why I do it because it gets yeah. me. The I'm like, okay, this is how yeah. he is. You know? He is. Yeah, totally. Piper and Sandra said you did an incredible job with Marie's voice. Um, uh, Fish, you deleted the question. Oh no. <laughs> Fish. I think it's will. You, I think it's will you ever do more female voices? Yes. There you go. That's a, that's very exciting. I I want to ask about one, but not here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's circle back to your favorite noises and sound effects to record and edit for season four. My favorite noises and sound effects. Uh, my favorite sound to record. Okay, I can say to use. I really loved the shotgun. For the butcher scene, I looked a long time for the right punch. I wanted that movie punch of a shotgun, not a real one, but like a bam. Um, and I really liked that. I remember at the butcher, I wanted to count the shells and make it authentic, but then I was like, "This is boring and not as fun." I so my favorite like sound, I didn't make it, but my favorite sound effect was the shotgun. There's an easy answer. And my favorite to record and edit. Wait, what was the other question I skipped? Um, it was, what's your least favorite scene you had to record? For season four? Oh, no. So the first one that we skipped was the favorite noises and sound effects to record slash edit for season four. Yeah, so we'll say shotgun because it's fun. I never yeah. get to use a shotgun. Arthur's never going to use a shotgun. <laughs> he'll, he'll use something. but uh, uh, And then what's your least favorite scene you've had to record? My least favorite scene, man. Oh, I'm sure there's one, and I would have to look at the timeline of season four. What the fuck happened in season four? Probably. I think this could be. They did. They didn't say season four, so it could be any right anything all over. My least favorite. I know you've least. said that it was draining to do some of the really emotional scenes, especially where you, when you have to cry. But that's really not least favorite. Yeah, that wasn't too bad. It felt nice. I like when I was talking about the duck pond stuff, I was actually crying, which was really easy because it was just my own history. Mm -hmm. So I just had to tell it and, and feel emotional about it, which is so easy when you love your kids. Um, I, 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 yeah, my least favorite scene was probably somewhere in season two, probably. I would say the m Moss Man. <laughs> <laughs> honestly if someone if, if there was like a visual rep if we wanted to go through a cole's note of the seasons i would find it but i, I can't think of what happens I yeah don't know what happens yeah three. no it's fine it'll come back um, to me yeah mirmo asks when fans guess an outcome for something you have planned as a fun reveal have you ever made alterations for how you were originally planning on presenting that reveal not that you've changed the reveal itself but just the presentation of it or have you let it unfold in the way you originally planned it's a good question i don't i don't think a fan has guessed exactly the way i'm going to reveal anything hmm. i i know a lot of fans have been like, oh, this is coming up. But I, 
and I'm not, this is not to rag on anybody, but like a lot of the reveals are things that I, you know, like hinted at. Like a lot of people kind of were, were like, ah, I, 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 I guessed it for like, you know, season five. But, you know, five years ago, I I went there in our Call of Cthulhu games to like, you know what I mean? So it's not so much of a, of a, of a figured it out so much as a, this is the the thing that I'm I'm telling. Mm-hmm. I would say the real there, there's only been like two or three real twists. I would say in the in the entire show, you know. Yeah. But even like like to say, oh, I figured out it was the King in Yellow before it was revealed. That's not really a reveal. That's like, well, yeah, because I wrote it so, <laughs> so that it makes sense. Like yeah. It's, it's for people to go, oh, that's. Mm-hmm. That's what makes that's the thing that he was hinting at, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like put it this way, if someone was like, "Oh, that hole in the wall is Arthur breathing." What what? Time no. Is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't hear that, guys. Nothing. I totally forgot. <laughs> Nothing. Anyway. It's fine. Moving on. Anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> Point, All right, anyway, my ask. point is if there was a if 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 there was a, if someone said, "Oh, the 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 butcher is on their side." That would be a legit, oh, they called it. That would be an example of someone f- guessed that and they figured that and they just totally out of the whim were like, this would be cool. I didn't see anyone get that, but if they did, full kudos to them for figuring that out because that's that would be a cool, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But beyond that, the rest of it is just extrapolation of details that I'm for trying sure. to add to the show. For sure. And I think even when people are guessing the stuff or they followed it along and picked up the breadcrumbs and like, you know, which is the wonderful. Way, which is great. The way that you reveal it, I think, too. I mean, with the end of, with part 40 and intermezzo, I mean, there's no, nobody saw that coming. Uh, well, and, okay. I, and yeah, and that's, again, that's kind of where I'm getting at, where it's like, if someone knew what was coming based on the extrapolation of the breadcrumbs that I've been leaving, no, of course I wouldn't change it because that's, I've been leading you there. That's yeah. what, that's what I want you. If you know it before the character says it, that's just because the pieces have been going there. If someone was like, Hey, I wonder if the butcher is going to side with, you know, if someone called that and a, and a theory caught on, yeah, I probably would have been like, damn. And I might've, I might've tried to change something. Because that was trying to be a twist. So right. there's the answer. So I, yeah. I, I might have wanted to, yeah. Tao asks, what would have happened if Arthur had not trusted John as much as he did? Well, you see that in season three with Yellow. Yeah. There's yeah. the easiest answer that I can give. Raina asks, this is, there's lead up and then question. Um, yeah. Raina says... I've noticed how many of the villain characters you write have extremely different themes and motivations from each other, which always keeps the plot fresh and dynamic. Some of them fit thematically with the malevolent atmosphere, while others contrast as if from a different genre, like Kane and the Butcher, while still tying in with the core themes. What is your favorite kind of villain character to write? I mean, Larson is is so good. I mean, I so I... I've always felt so so on Larson, but and this is part forty, you know, spoilers. But when Larson shoots Noel again, mm, God, that felt so good to do. I was like so excited. I was like, what a fucking shit bag. And I love the pathetic villain. Um I and, and I never I never realized that was my favorite to write, but I would say it's that. And I, you know, I Larson reminds me so much of something. I don't know, some 80s movie villain. Um, there's a patheticness about him, a like a weeniness, um, but so vile, you know. Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. It's been on the tip of my tongue for months now, and I just can't remember it. But there's like, you know, like it's like it's like the Joaquin Phoenix from Gladiator mixed ah. with a bit of like the diehard Alan Rickman where they're they're not they're not even that smart they're just shitty and they twist the knife and i i always dis- the kind of villain that when you're watching a movie you're like oh i want the bad guy to rip this guy's fucking head off like i want this bad guy to suffer 
Yep. Not Zorg from Fifth Element Train, although I would say the accent is on point. And I do love Gary Oldman. He's so good. But like, it's the, it's the, Zorg isn't, I, I mean, Gary Oldman's is so menacing, but I, I, Zorg isn't that menacing to me. I don't know why. He's just not, he doesn't do enough twisting of the knife for me. Even when he shoots her in the vents, I don't, it doesn't do it for me. But it, it's some, I think it's probably more Joaquin Phoenix, honestly, when he like mm -hmm. stabs Russell Crowe at the end, you know, just, just to be a, piece of shit yep yep he thinks that larson's so funny because he thinks he's cool like alan rickman in prince of thieves but he's actually like roger reese and robin hood men in sights like <laughs> yes yeah you know? exactly r.i.p um the idea of he, like that pathetic villain that like just he'll, he'll never accomplish anything again my favorite line from him from season four is that line when Kane turns to him and says you, do, you, you don't get it you know and Kane's talking about names and he's just like no like I don't get it and and Kane's like because you're you're nothing because you, you suck so bad you suck you're such a loser <laughs> so I really I really liked I really liked um him because he's also in, in, intimidating you know like yes he, he I I do think he's that's exactly the kind of villain that I I, I do find scary because they're so Gross. You know what? It reminds me of like a Coen Brothers villain, and I love the Coen Brothers. Not like a No Country Coen Brothers, but like a Blood Simple, like uh, almost like goofy, but like a oh, Fargo. Honestly, like Fargo is a great example of like you know that Peter Stormer Fargo is like, you know, he's 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 just weird and like very different yeah. vibes, but like almost goofy looking, like Peter Stormer's goofy looking, and then mm -hmm. at the end he's like chopping a guy up, and you're like, yeah. oh my god, yeah. Anyway, have you watched the latest season? I've never seen the show. I started it. And I was like, oh, this is just the movie. And then I, I stopped it. But then I heard it goes on to other stuff. So It does. I think you would really like this latest season. And you don't have to. They're all like separate. Yeah, they're all in, they're all different storylines. Mm -hmm. right? Like is technically it, okay. there's a few connections, but you don't need to know any of it. I would No, I would Joe have... and I definitely want to watch it. I think I'd give it another shot. Yeah, I would just skip to the most recent one, honestly. Uh, but OK, we're getting off. Are you uh, McGregor? Q&A canceled. Let's just talk about stuff we've been watching. <laughs> Tom asks, uh, John seems to view Arthur as his link to humanity, much like a child looks to their parents to teach them what's morally correct. Is this more why he was trying to get Arthur to be kinder or make the right choice? And I assume they mean in season three. Um, yeah. It feels like it's more this than John actually making growth on their own. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, Tom yeah. nailed it. It's exactly it. Uh, and again, a lot of, and I, I think I said this in our um q a which will go on the public feed shortly but just to reiterate um yeah when i when i call john a child it's emotionally a child it's not about ship it's not about shitting on people who want to ship them or anything like that it's about how this character is emotionally trying to see arthur as the beacon of what he's supposed to be and when arthur doesn't do it properly john doesn't understand and he gets pissed off at him you know what i mean it's like yeah, 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 I can't explain yeah. it any more concise than yeah. you did. You did a great job, Tom. Tippity asks, ever since Arthur gave John his title, I've been curious about it. Can you talk a little about how Unconquerable and Undefeated compare for you? Do you see them as the same, similar, counterposed, or completely different? Oh, good question. Um, unconquerable, Undefeated. Yeah, I mean, Unconquerable... Well, so Undefeated has a long lineage in the Invictus stream. It came about, we had a show called Chapters of the Undefeated. Um, and it was, it's a Patreon tier as well. So it was also kind of like a bit of like a, a nod to that. But also Invictus, you know, is literally defined, uh, literally translate to the Undefeated, doesn't it? Or something? I can't remember. It's, it's, it's one of those two. But uh, in terms of, you know, unconquerable, it means, you know, no matter what can come at you, you won't give up. You know, you can't be put down. Whereas undefeated is when all those things are at you, you know, the idea of even having the possibility of, of being defeated, you know, even the possibility of being somebody who loses less than less than choosing to give up you know what i mean i guess those are really the same thing i don't know it's a good question i wish i i wish i had a clearer answer dipity asks really good questions yeah 
Hong Kong won't even compare for you. Do you see them as the same yeah. similar counterparts or completely different? I see them as different. I guess I can't really understand why, though. Unconquerable and undefeated. They feel so different. One's kind of, oh, well, I guess it's sort of the difference between, like, omnipotence and, um, uh, what's the one that means? Omnipresent? Uh, 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 omnipotence and there's what you know what never mind both of us are too we're both, tired for this we're both doing the same thing and we're like uh, <laughs> uh well, i mean yeah so invictus is latin for unconquered which is the the uh, the, the range for unconquerable and the undefeated mm -hmm. was partially kind of an inside joke but i do see them as different i guess it's like envy and jealousy in terms omniscience, of omniscience like, michael thank you yes oh, there you go omniscience is what i was trying to there you go trin you know what trin is such a better look there you go unconquerable can't be overcome undefeated means you had to fight for it that's that's the Thank vibe you. I'm going with. Trin wins two points. Two points to Trin. To that's, Trinidor. That's the, that's the published author for you, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. What are, what are you got nothing? We're an yeah. hour and ten minutes into this. I know you. Have, you were just. I'm getting. Goofballs. Don't worry. I'm back on. I'm back. Okay. On. Okay. Yami asks, uh, "When did you decide to have the butcher point of view for 34?" <laughs> Probably chapter, um, whatever came right before that. Before it. I, cool. I, so yeah, the end of 33, I was literally, I finished that last chapter and I was writing the next one. And I was like, you know what actually it was partly because I realized the perspective of Arthur in that would be boring as fuck because it would be, it's just him running from an antagonist. Right. And I was like, well, what, what is that? You know, he can't talk right here, upstairs, hide quickly, stop moving. I was like, this isn't a show, but hunting I can throw in the cops showing up and I can have I can have the butcher's psyche and we don't have John and we get to hear what Arthur would sound like without talking to John. And I was just like, well, that's the way to tell that story. And that story needs to be told. I just I need to I need to tell it from the perspective that would be more interesting to hear. Yeah. And then and it will it, probably happen again, frankly, if I need to do it. So yeah. Not I mean, I love those those bottle ups. Um I know you rewatched Buffy semi recently. There's so many great bottle apps like that. Oh my God. And, yeah. I love yeah. episodes like that. And I always find those are the most creative. And honestly, I'm proud that Malevolent does stuff like that. I don't think a lot of other audio dramas do things like that. Like where they're just like, oh, one episode is real different. But to me, that's the fun of doing a show that's so, you know, like just one person doing it. I don't have to check with anybody else. I'm like, ah, fuck it. Let's do a weird one this week, you know? Mm hmm. Queen asks, we know Malevolent started without a plot, so the polls were helpful to decide the direction. Has that changed, even though you now clearly have a plot? How do you benefit, emotionally or otherwise, from the interactive element of Malevolent to this day? Hmm, that's a good question, Queen. Yeah, because I would say there's definitely times where I uh, wish there wasn't a poll. <laughs> not because I don't love the people voting or because the vote's not important, but because... Like, you know, sometimes, especially with a baby now, it's like, man, I'd like to do the next episode, but I got to wait a week. You know what I mean? That can be a real detriment. Um, but in terms of the positive, I mean, honestly, it's really nice when I'm stuck at a point that I really don't know which would be a more interesting path than it's out of my hands. Problem is I still get the flack for it. <laughs> They're like, why would Arthur do this? I'm like, well, I don't know. It would be interesting. <laughs> um, has it changed though that you clearly have a plot? Yeah, so it's changed in sort of those aspects, but it it hasn't changed in terms of its usefulness when it hits really well. Like I would say, again, it's tough to reference newer episodes because they're not out yet. But I would say in season five so far, episode or part one, um, yeah, there's been some really fun moments based on the Patreon choices that I wouldn't have instinctually written. And it's kind of nice to have that out of my hands. And I, mm. I think I'll always enjoy that because I think, frankly, going on four, four years now or whatever, however long we've been doing this, it's you kind of need something to keep you interested. And the poll is always going to be a point of fun, honestly, to, to have that. So even the days where I'm like, oh, I wish I could do the next episode, it is nice to have that pressure taken off to be like well guess what you know and, and that's probably the improv improv side of me you know it's like comics will do their stand-up forever 
and you'll always hear comics will still go to the improv when they visit a city because that's how they get that kind of like you know their juices flowing the stuff that mm -hmm. they wouldn't think of you know yeah yep quill and thea both asked about possible au projects of malevolent you've opened up the potential for alternate timelines have you ever wanted to do a one shot or special exploring those different realities alternate versions of previous episodes or what ifs exploring what would happen if the voices chose differently tumblr won't let me answer this one there you go there you go <laughs> <Your answer. laughs> it's always spiders asks why was Hester so careful when John was attached to Arthur to the point where he played it safe for months to get John back only to chuck him into the dark world when he found he didn't fit? Sorry, read that again. Yeah. Or say that again. Why um, was Haster so... Why was Haster I don't really so... use the name Haster. That's why it threw me off. Uh, why was the king so careful when John was attached to Arthur uh, only to chuck John into the dark world when he found John didn't fit? Be careful? Yeah. Oh, so that's an interesting question. It brings me back a little bit, which I appreciate. So I guess you're talking about season two, right? When... Yeah, well, in season one, you know, the go. king, yeah, uh, you know, he's he's luring them in season one. He's like playing with them in season two. And then the minute he gets drawn back, he's like, fuck this guy and chucks him out. So he couldn't. Is that? Oh yeah, okay. That's not an intermezzo. I was like, that's season four when when it's revealed that he was in the dark world. I was like, okay, yes, yes, um, yeah. So uh, basically, in the real world, the king, being only half the king, did not have influence enough to do anything. He could whisper in the ears of those around him and try to affect the people around Arthur, but a big part of it was also trying to figure out where his other half went. You know, he can't just like look in the other world and be like, oh, there's my guy. So for a long time, he was using these whispers around, like uh, I think a little bit of like Kellen and the lady in the apartment and eventually through the dreams as Adam Fry to find information that would sort of impede their journey to the point where he could get them into a position that would benefit him. At the same time, he's contacting his cultists, telling him to expect this person because forces beyond have sort of dictated that there's a timeline or there's a approach that will happen. And this is kind of what's revealed when they get to the hotel. Uh, I think the big part of this is why is he checking into the dark world? Well, and this, may i mean probably will be revealed but essentially when john came back to the king in yellow after the end of season two he was fighting him there was a constant battle between the king and yellow he was not whole in the way that he anticipated he brought on this i guess to him an infected piece of him and even though it seems like he chucked him real quick, time in the dreamlands and as we learn, the dark world moves very differently. So imagine you losing a hand and then finally getting it back and finding that the hand does not do what you want it to do. You know, mm -hmm. Ultimately, you can try to make this hand work or give it the ultimate punishment because you now know what its biggest fear would be and send it to the place that ultimately would ruin it. Because for the months previous, you've already kind of existed without it. And you realize that, well, you know, maybe here's here's where I'm at. I can do this better without you. So long and short of it is he chucked him into the dark world because John wouldn't play ball with the original King in Yellow. And ultimately, the King in Yellow at that point wanted to hurt John more than help him. This Makes is sense. Answer. Totally makes sense. Fish says, John was singing the song that never ends over and over. That's why the king trashed him. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You know, I thought a lot about, like, what happened during that time. And there was a time that I thought about making that um, prelude, uh, seeing what kind of would happen, uh, you know, because uh, between those pieces, you know, we've, I've dealt with flashbacks, the prison pits and stuff. And I thought it would be really interesting to see at the end of season three what happened to John that cast him into the dark world because once John came back, I always knew where I wanted, you know, uh, John to have been because there's a story there that needs to be told. And you can even go back and listen to season three now. And when John 
there's I think one of the first lines Arthur says something about the dark world and John's like yeah yeah cool <laughs> he's like very weird about it you know and I yeah. think at the time people were theorizing I remember a few people being like oh my god was he in the dark world so yeah he just didn't play ball and he got tossed he did I think that's the answer right why is she so careful yeah yeah, yeah 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 and he was careful just because he he was only half a person half a soul um Toyna asks in a lot of what you have written, there is a dimension of collective writing, audience participation, or both. What does this change with the type of stories you tell uh, slash how they're told compared to writing something completely on your own like Divisor? I think having them be more interactive, audience participation, keeps me motivated to come back to it over and over again. I think it's really nice to have things that make you excited to continue to touch on something you know i think that's one of the best things from malevolent is that every week you know even if i like i have to fly by the seat of my pants even if i want to write the ending now it's not guaranteed to be that way by the nature of the show and that's really exciting so it keeps me honest in a way to be like well i gotta do it again for better or for worse which i really really like um additionally when you're participating in like an rpg sense you get to bring on the talents of the people that you have in your game you know i've played games that you know some really funny or creative people were in and uh you know they they brought something to the character that just blew me away you know i get to do it all the time with dice shame our actual play podcast which you should check out if you haven't listened to it check it out shamepodcast.com um you know where where a direction a character takes something or or they ask me a prompt because i know they're going to be doing something in the game and it's like okay they're like this is this is cool uh you know like last week or literally we were recording yesterday and rob asked me what my character's favorite food is that his character would have tried and it was just a nice opportunity because a i knew he was going to be doing something in game but also it's a cool thing to have people actively thinking about in a sense, the product or the story with you, you know, you're all you're all walking towards the same finish line. And it's very interesting to do it that way. In terms of the stories that I choose to tell on my own. It's much more concise. It's much I, I think to a degree, I feel more. I don't know. I don't want to say proud of it because I'm almost more proud of dice shame in some ways. But I think I get to I get to tell more of my voice in something like that, but I tire of them quicker. Like, you know, when Divisor was done, I haven't touched it since. I haven't really even thought about it. You know, I should do a commentary for it and I will, but you know, it's easier to be like, ah, because there's nothing keeping me honest. There's nothing, there's no expectation from a weekly, you know, game or poll that's keeping me coming back. So yep, yep. But good question, Toynette. I relate to that a lot. Um, from Laura and Laura, you're right. It is a better spelling of Laura. Uh, what made you decide the era slash time, which malevolence is, um, set in? Oh, I love that era. I, I mean, yeah, you look, <laughs> I am cliche in many, many ways. I was definitely, uh, someone who was like, Ooh, cool. The nostalgia of the twenties. And like my first email address had Sinatra in it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I yep. was a big fan of like that kind of music. I still am. Obviously I still love crooning those songs on our karaoke yeah. machine. Yeah. We got a karaoke machine. What? What? Uh, <laughs> it was, it, I, I, I always loved it. I remember one of the first things I ever bought myself. I've never smoked a day in my life. But one of the first things I bought myself from the little kiosk at the mall was a little engraved cigarette case because I thought it was so cool. And I just put stuff in it. Like, you know, I remember having money and collecting it because I just thought it was so, and my parents would be like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> <laughs> but I really liked it. And uh, I always loved that aesthetic. And when I grew up and I started playing RPGs and I found out about Call of Cthulhu, the truth of the matter is the horror was irrelevant what type it was call of cthulhu could have been you know a, a a subset of the great god pan's like whole uh type of horror it could have been uh 
you know, I don't know. It, it could have been Geiger-esque horror. It could have been Aliens. That was all irrelevant to me. What stuck to me was the fact that it took place in the 1920s and the 1930s, honestly, and that it was horror. If Call of Cthulhu hadn't been Cthulhu, if, if it had been Call of, you know, some other horror deity, uh, I would be, the Malabo would be a very different podcast. Uh, and that's kind of why I've always been like, fuck Lovecraft. I don't give a shit about him. I like the aesthetic. I like the vibes. I love the world. And uh, I've now enjoyed a lot of the type of horror with the creatures. And that's become something that I really enjoy now. But yeah, I was, was all about the aesthetic. And I think that comes across in Malevolent. I think each season, and maybe it just clicks for some people now, but each season is a very distinct, uh, you know, vibe to it. A very distinct aesthetic. Like season one is that 1920s smoky Arkham, you know, and season two is the dreamland. Season three <laughs> is that like depressive, oppressive northern wilds. Season four is like the New York gritty. And season five... You'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, Thais asks if you could pick a favorite moment of this of season four to be put on screen in animation or live action. What moment would it be? I've got my answer. I got my answer already. The scene when the butcher comes sure. through the front door. I mean uh, that. For, basically, I would want it's it open up at Arthur and Daniel sitting at that thing and then just the tail end of the conversation where Daniel's like, because they say something really sweet, you know, like, oh, you know, I, I love you too. And then I think the phone rings, Daniel gets up, walks off, you know, there's like a miscommunication and then bam, the shotgun comes in, he's singing and it's just, because you could like almost do it in slow motion, right? Like, you know, and they're just like, oh, that'd be so fun. I would get chills watching it. Yeah, bam. that's a fan project. Animated. I mean, there you go. I would yeah. totally do that. That'd be fucking fun. Uh, what yeah. was yours though? Mine's in part forty where the shit goes down. Um, the big fight scene. Yeah, that'd be cool. That would yeah. be cool. It's so interesting because I think everyone, and that's the cool thing about podcasts, is like everyone who's listening to that is picturing a different room. And uh, you know, I the way I'm picturing the room is different than the way I'm searching. Like I have a I. No word of a lie. In my mind right now, I have an exact image and layout of Daniel's house. I know what it looks like. And I'm curious sometimes how much other people have seen that. Like, I, and, and to, to so much to the point that, and, and funnily enough, when I did um, Marie's Attic, I, I knew how I wanted it to look. I was like, hey, Marie's Attic is going to look in a very specific way because I wanted to kind of write it effectively. And I try to describe it in a way that people could also kind of see it. And the, this is exactly how the attic looked in my mind. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the bed to the north, the stairs going out. And I still wonder to this day if people like also see that or if they, you know, made their own versions of it. But anyway, in my mind, that, 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 sh that butcher entrance. Yeah. But you yeah. know what? Prelude would be a good one, too. Because Prelude yeah. is like short enough and self-contained and it's got the flashback. It, that'd be really, really tight to see that done. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Amanda the Cryptid asks, what character changed the most from their original conception to how they actually behave in the podcast? Whoa, that's a good question. What are some characters? <laughs> um... <laughs> um Larson, uh, Kellen. Larson's a good answer. Larson's a good answer. Kellen, no, he was pretty tight from the beginning. Yeah. Oscar um, was pretty tight. I mean, he changed, but I kind of always knew, I like I wrote him to change. I didn't know how I was going to change him, but I wrote him with the intention to grow. Yeah. Marie. Noel, I knew. Marie, no, she's pretty consistent, I think, right? Yeah. I don't think she's I mean, doing not that, I don't think it's asking so much about like consistency so much as like when you first conceived of having a landlady mm. versus how they became or how like Amanda used the word behave, you know, did you know that Marie was going to end up being you know by the yeah, end Yeah, I mean she was she was definitely meant to be like a connection where she ended up I, you yeah. know what? I, I, I Larson. I was a Larson because Larson, and I mentioned this before. 
Larson was kind of only really meant to be a season three antagonist. Like I, I think he was going to season three was going to be a little longer and he was going to be more focused, you know, like he would come back up and kill Larson and then there would be fallout. But based on some choices, some stuff went awry based on some choices in the mine and some choices that patrons made. We lost about two episodes of what I envisioned that season to be. And I couldn't tell you now where they were uh, because I just don't remember. But um, I would say Larson wasn't meant to be as, you know, as vindictive as he wanted. But then I also just really liked him. So maybe, maybe it was, it was, I mean, it was for the better, but uh, uh, probably someone from the dreamlands too would be an easy answer. Character mm. the most concession. Yeah. No, I uh, Larson. Let's go with Larson. Okay. <laughs> Nova Stella asks, is there a chance uh, that we'll have a blooper reel in the future? Uh, no, no, <laughs> uh, there's a short answer and I'm sorry. And I'll tell you why Nova Stella. I, it's, it, so I write Monday. Well, now I write Friday. I write Friday. I record Sunday. I edit Monday. That's like my malevolent days. Sometimes I do everything on a Monday. If I'm making bloopers, like if I'm fucking up enough to to record an entire scene that I cut, a it's not funny because it's not there's nothing off the cuff, right? Like I'm sitting there, it's just going to be like cut content, right? And if it's cut content, it's cut because it's not good, like like not even interesting, just like extra words or like unnecessary shit. You know what I mean? Uh, so yeah, I, I I no, there there won't be bloopers. I mean, I may as a joke one time make a fake blooper reel. Mm. I could see John and Arthur breaking. What 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 you just stepped on my line? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. You know, that could be funny, but now that I've said it, I'll never do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh can can you give uh Nova Stella an an eight ball? Oh sure, I'll do it. Jo hold on, the Joe says there is a blooper that she can think of, and I don't know which. I'll give me an Tumblr won't let me answer this one. There you go. Repeat, sorry. Uh, Daisy asks, what would have happened if we had chosen oh, to go willingly right. in part 198? Oh, did Joe? Yeah, there, <laughs> there is a blooper. <laughs> I forgot. There is a blooper. It's not a blooper that anyone would like. No. <laughs> There's, listen, I'll go in and I, I will record all of John. I will record all of Arthur and I will record all of them. <laughs> and sometimes I do it before and after dinner. And there's a few where I'm like burping and stuff. And <laughs> there, there's a few that like the burps uh, land at pretty funny moments. But but I, I would never release that because it's just, first off, it's like three seconds because it doesn't happen that much. And uh and it's not uh, it's not that funny, but anyway, it's very funny for me and Joe. It doesn't <laughs> Joe only blooper Bo a burp a burp reel would be awful. No oh, one would enjoy it. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, okay, Daisy, we are getting to your question. I promise. What so would sorry. have happened if we had chosen to go willingly in part one ninety eight? Oh, uh, cosmic horror, probably. That's apt. That's very apt. <laughs> Good yeah. job, eight ball. Vile decrepit kidney asks, "Who is your favorite and least favorite character to write and act?" Favorite to write and act is Larson. I think just he's really fun. Least favorite, probably. Over the whole series, probably the probably yellow. Hmm. Yeah, I don't really like writing or acting yellow. R.I.P. I don't know what the dis the Discord is probably gonna. <laughs> I love you guys. Okay, Cass asks. I don't know. I mean, like he, he he's. Oh, I don't get. I, I don't get it. I, I know. Mean, I know me, you don't. I know. He's just don't. a version of John that's more boring. <laughs> To me, he's just he's just John <laughs> without any of the fun dead. stuff that's happened in the show. <laughs> I, don't, I, I genuinely uh, don't get it. <laughs> drag him. Okay, Cass asks a a favorite song that you have written. Oh, that's a good question. 
Um, a favorite song that I've written. Yeah, man, it's so, you know it's so fun because I never thought when I started the show that I would be doing the music. I always wanted to, but I didn't own at the time any of the software, and I didn't own a keyboard to do it. And then the old musician we had a falling out, and I decided to redo it myself. And I love it, and I really like the theme. Man, that's a great question. I really like uh, "Bittersweet City," which is what I call the theme that plays when basically it starts off in in the the city. Anytime they uh, they're basically walking the streets, and because I have all my shit plugged in, I can just play a few seconds of it. Oh yes, please. Um, this one. I, I really like it. I just think it's really pretty and simple. Yeah. So that one's called Bittersweet City. I really like that one. And then I like Noel's theme because it's a play on Bittersweet City. It's the same start, but it, it dissolves a little different because Noel City is New York. And I wanted to kind of have like a musical parallel between that. Which is interesting. I never get to talk about the music. I really like this question. And uh, I would say beyond those two, which I like, I would say the one I'm most proud of, a favorite song I've written. Yeah. Um, I really like the This Too Shall Pass, which is this one. That one is like, do, 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 do. Um, but I, I would say the OG theme for Rose Song, to me, it, it has it's it stands the test of time, um, but honestly, I think every new song I write, I, I enjoy. I, I, the The newest song for season five is called "Lost," and I've kind of it's John's theme because everyone's had a theme, but I haven't really given him a theme yet, purposefully because I wanted to uh, do it. But this is the new theme for season five. I think some people have heard already because they've listened to season five, but really like that one. I like one of my favorite movies uh, of all time is called the legend of 1900. And if anyone hasn't seen it, I highly recommend seeing it. It stands the test of time. It is absolutely one of my favorite movies stars tin roth it's uh the music is done by ennio morricone who does like the thing and all those cool musics but it's a it's a big piano movie and if you ever play piano or if you're a fan of piano uh you should watch it it's really sad do not watch the director's cut it's not as bad it's just it's much funnier and it, it just the the theatrical cut is better um but anyway yeah i i really like those ones i'd say bittersweet city is my favorite Good question, though. Man, it's really nice to get to talk about the music. Because I'm such an audiophile as well. And you know this about me, Ren. But, like, yeah, sometimes it's really nice to get to, like, pivot and be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have extra time if you want to talk more about the music. Um, I have <laughs> no, a final no, no. I mean, question. A I, have question. A final, I have a final question saved, but we got through all the questions. That's it? There's only one left? Uh, Yeah. Well, I have a note to circle back to KM's question about fan projects. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, oh, yeah, actually, good. Cool. Okay. So, Abriel didn't submit a question uh, originally because she was like, oh, there's too many. I'm not going to do one. But hers was actually about composition. So, somebody finally pulled it up for me. Um, cool. Do you ever pick which keys to compose in based on how they relate to each other? Or is it just the vibes? And do you associate certain keys with certain moods? Ah. Uh, Great question. Um, yeah, so uh, composing, it, you know, it's funny. I, I have a real issue with calling myself a writer or a voice actor or a composer. So we'll just say the songs I make. But the way I do the songs I make 99% of the time is either under force of will or like, no joke, this lost. I was lying in bed and I was like, oh. Da, 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 da. And like got up, pulled my piano out, and like wrote and like 
played that line. I was like, oh, that's cool. Played it again. And then, you know, threw it into my program and then didn't touch it for two days and then sat back and I was like, what is this? It was like two in the morning too. I was like, oh, this is a... So I think very much when I'm composing something new, when I'm writing something new, it's it's kind of just something that comes to me. Because I knew, again, I was thinking a lot about John for season five and, and I knew I wanted something kind of sad and like a little bit heroic. Um, but absolutely... I do compose how they relate to each other. And I just got to show you an example with the bittersweet city and the Knowles theme, how their plays on each other, as well as, um, I don't think many people know this either, but the season three theme is called, um, for Rose Waltz. Uh, it's kind of Larson's theme and it sounds like this. which you, you know, might recognize that again is a, is a play on the similar theme with Faroe, but that is also the song that they play in the bar uh, on the piano when they're like, boom, ga, ga, boom, ga, ga. that's the same. Yeah. It's, it's the same progression. So I, I really enjoy having like musical parallels like that, where like the song that you're hearing is the one playing here. And the one that you're hearing here is it. I, and I do try to be more or less consistent with that. I'm not so consistent that because I've I've seen some people very kindly be like, "Oh, we're hearing this song, that means this," and like kind of look into it. I'm not that creative with it. I'm very much on like the vibes. Like you'll hear "Bittersweet City," even though it was like the New York theme, come up in season five probably because sometimes the vibes are just right for that. Yeah. Uh, and that's where it comes up. But like, you'll never hear Peggy Gordon again. You know what I mean? Unless music played it. And that was kind of really cool getting to explore that love of music through the butcher as well, because I was a bit of myself in that, you know? Uh, but yeah, yeah so what was the question? Oh, uh, whether or not Harlan's ever picks up which key to compose and bass. No, no, the keys, I'll sit down at the piano, I'll play, and then I'll just kind of move the key depending on where I want. I might move the key to B, which is the key of like, you know, Faroe's song and Faroe's lullaby because I might want it to be similar or I'll move it down to a key because I want it to be, but we'll see probably more of those in season six, like little changes. Uh, and keys with moods? No, not really. I mean, you know, minor, sad, majors, happy, but <laughs> fun question though. Uh, um, okay. Uh, oh, <laughs> um, Queen wants to know if you would ever release um, malevolent stuff on vinyl. Oh my god, yeah, that'd be so cool. Could you imagine? But I don't. Right, that'd be so uh, cool. I, so cool. With, I don't think with then the season covers as the oh, album covers. They'd be Dude. good album covers too, right? They would be good album covers. I would totally do that. I don't think malevolence music is good enough personally, <laughs> and I don't. I don't think the recordings are good enough. Like, here's the thing: if I was convinced, if someone was like, "No, no, no," like it's worth it. I would have to re-record them or have somebody re-record them or something. Like if if the notes are good enough, because it's I don't know, I, I, I you know I, I I would want it to be. I don't want Anthony Fratano Fratano to be like, what the fuck is this shit? You know, I want I want needle drop to be like, yeah, this is well produced. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Um. Before we get to the last question. Um band projects have you thought of any more besides obviously somebody needs to now make album covers of this oh covers. yeah fan projects man okay oh i i mean yeah i would love i mean i i was blown away by the book i would love uh, the tarot cards are playing cards playing cards would be mm -hmm. so cool mm -hmm. playing cards are a slam dunk dice yeah malevolent inspired dice um yeah uh, uh lighter or even like, uh, you know, be cool, like malevolent, man. Because the thing is, and I, the thing I love about KM's projects, shout out to KM. Huge shout is out. that there's many. Like, like I love, like, like a playing card or a tarot deck would be perfect because there's like many, many artists get to contribute. Hmm. You know, and all the ideas I'm coming up with, like, they're just like one or two. So it'd have to be something. Because I was thinking like even something cool like a matchbook or something fucking cool like that would be neat. But it's just kind of like a one and done. And art pieces are cool. But again, they're one and done. Uh, did anyone else come up with any ideas? 
I uh, so Moon much. says, does, does Harlan know there's malevolent tea flavors on Adagio? Which is where I don't people, even know what Adagio is. Adagio is a tea company, and people make up their own flavors and then name them fan stuff. So there's like some no. Sherlock Holmes ones and Doctor Who, and you can, you know, get something that the person had, you know, they'll put Bergamot, they'll put whatever. Well, in I'll there. know what fucking I'm ordering right after this call. Right after this. Some goddamn tea. Absolutely. And hopefully it's Canadian as well. I didn't even know that. That's so cool. It is. His pink has some here. Oh, fuck. I want to try that. I also want to make one now because I love tea. I want to make a, I mean, yeah, I wonder where people are at. I wonder if I'll sip it and be like, yeah, that's John. Or I'll be like, this isn't John at all. <laughs> ah. Oh, that's so oh, cool. I did not so know cool. that. That's a great thing. Okay, I'll find these out. I'd love, I, I feel like the Dice Jam characters need their own teas too, for sure. Absolutely. Very, it'd be like very fruity. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, some I, playing cards after tarot cards. I would say playing cards would be a would be a slam dunk. Candles, oh, candles. leveling candles. <laughs> That's there's no art there. Um, st uh, stickers are easiest. Magnets. Come on, someone give me some more ideas. There's so many cool <laughs> things I want to hear. I just want to <laughs> say it so that they go, oh, and then they do it, and then I get to buy it. So I would totally fucking buy it. What? Yeah. Field notes yeah. books, which I still have yours on my desk, by the way. Oh, oh, got yeah. It's got ideas for intermezzo in it. <laughs> there you go. If 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 you haven't heard intermezzo yet, there's your little sneak peek. <laughs> you see it all. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I would love. Oh, somebody says oh. benevolent benevolent apron. I no, because I I just googled what's a funny apron. Like, where's oh. the sausage? Is like an actual apron. The reason I did that mm -hmm. is because that's to me part of the joke. That it's not. If it was an original joke, it wouldn't right. be as funny. It has to right, be a right. stupid apron that he bought at the store. Um, I got I got one though. It it would be tough for Cam to do, but it, like I would love to see at some point a video game, like a malevolent mm -hmm. video game. And it's funny because Rob Donaldson and I talked many times about like a point and click because I love point and click adventure games. But oh my god. Point click adventure game would be fucking awesome. Um, but something art, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, art coasters, ah, <gasps> coasters, yes, like sure. wood carved coasters. <laughs> There's a company that makes candles for D and D campaigns, and so the scents Ooh. are like the library, and they even came up with a small one shot. It's like a gift thing where there's three candles, and then they write little scenes based on each candle and you're supposed to light them as you're sitting at the table to evoke the sense thing that's that cool. something like that would be really cool like picking, really cool. picking things that happen from season one two three four and then yeah yeah i love that i mean but i mean again to me that i think the thing that draws me so much the malevolent fan community is the art i've seen some absolutely phenomenal art like a really yeah. good art book like a hard bound art book of some theme because unfortunately and i know because trin i'm sure has written a lovely one in the in the fanzine i have i can't read it i don't i don't want to read it because i don't want any ideas mm -hmm. so, but like just an art book with like something you know some sort of writing in it would be so cool yeah i wish yeah. i had better ideas <laughs> well there's when you go back to the discord people are are chatting away um but i want to leave some time for um saying all the cool stuff that's happening this weekend in, in case people didn't see the opening ceremonies yes. so um here's the last question danny submitted a question on behalf of her mom so oh danny's mom Hi. yeah danny's mom um so here's a question from danny's mom dear oh, harlan no. dear no. harlan <laughs> Was there any literary influence that marked you deeply in your childhood or adolescence? Also, hi. Oh, hi, Danny's mom. Holy shit. First off, uh, thank you for Danny. I love Danny so much. Uh, they are so hilarious and wonderful and creative. You have done an amazing job ra raising them. And uh, I don't know if you're going to watch this or Danny will explain it to you. But thank you sincerely, Danny. Danny and me, honestly, every time I like post a screenshot of like playing Doom or something, Danny's like, oh yeah, I, I do that too. So 
I feel I feel very appreciative of of you for bringing Danny into this fandom. So thank yes, you. Yes, I do too. Uh, Danny, secondly, you're the best. Yes. Secondly, to answer your question, uh, was there any literary influence that marked you deeply in childhood? I mean, yeah, tons. Great question. I I remember. So there was this book called Bruce Coville's Book of Monsters. I think. And on the cover, there's this monster leaning over the bed with this kid. And he's got, and I think he's reading the book. It's like a book within a book. And it was like volume two or three or something. And within it, there was a number of short stories. And one of the short stories was a short story called Timmer and the Furnace Troll. And in the story... It's the last one in the book. And I remember because Bruce Colville, I think it's Bruce Colville, had like a little write-up before each story. And it was like a little prelude, you know? Be like, oh, I, I found this story in an old paperback magazine and I really liked it. It was very scary and you, you'll enjoy it too, kids. This is a kid book. And this last story, Timmer and the Furnace Troll, his write-up, his preamble was like, I don't know why I chose this one. It's horrible. I warned you. And I remember being like, okay. And it talks about this like elf who is in a classroom with other elves. And in this world, the elves like, you know, are, are powerful. And they're like a little, little, little like Keebler elves. They're not like elven elves, the Lord of the Rings elves. But they treat trolls like garbage. Like the trolls are like the uh, furnace people. And there's like a, like a take your kid to work day or something. And all the elves get to connect with uh, other elves in the school and Timmer is like bullied like mercilessly bullied and he ends up going uh with the furnace troll and everyone makes fun of him uh I can't even remember the troll's name it's a long name but anyway and he goes there and he talks to the furnace troll and the furnace troll is like really nice and he takes them on this like journey they they explore the history of the elves and the trolls and he shows him what his life is like. And he talks about being bullied. And it's really sweet and, and weird. And like there's undertones of like this blatant racism. And then at the end, Timmer doesn't want to go back to his classroom. And he says something to the lines of like, I, I wish that I could stay with you. I wish that I could become a troll. And the furnace troll is like, well, you can. I can tell you how. And then it cuts to the classroom. And at the end, Timmer and the Furnace Troll brutally murder every kid in the classroom. And I remember Timmer thrusts a pitchfork through a girl he likes. The troll picks up the teacher by the ankles and the wrists and splits her like an accordion. <laughs> and eats her. And, I mean, now, now I go back and I'm like... Okay, but as a kid, it fucked me up. I was like, I, I remember it was the first time I ever read something that my, like, my stomach felt upset. I was like, what is this? Reading, I remember I had to read the sentence like 10 times. I was like, what is this? And that scarred me in a way that I don't think anything ever could uh, stack up to because it, it, it stuck with me to this day. It's so fucked up. And at the end, Timmer becomes a troll and he walks away happy, having essentially murdered his class. And I don't really know what the point of the story is. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think it was an allegory. I don't think it was meant to be anything more than maybe brutality. I don't know. But it is so weird. And uh, it, it, I would say, Danny's mom, that was a major literary influence that marked me deeply uh, in my childhood. Yeah. Wild. Wild. Yeah. It was Do very... you think he was just like, well, it is a horror. It's like books about monsters. So I guess this you know, is where this is going now. I don't know. I, I, I often think about it. And I and I and and Liz is saying, I've, I've spoke about it in a Dice Shame intro before. And I think some people have heard about it. I didn't get to go into it as, in, in as depth as I got to right now because, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's a very 
very weird story. And I think there's things in our childhood, and I think we all have those moments, you know, a lot of people have that horse from the never ending story that are like, oh, this defined me. Um, uh, rarely is it, is it, you know, written in this graphic, but uh, yeah, that one, that one got with me. Danny says, thank you so much. Gonna love this so much, the wish or, oh, I'm so glad, Danny. Thank you so much. And thank you to your mom's awesome question. Yes. And uh, tell her that she's the only one that gets me. Besides <laughs> Joe, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Danny's mom, we're so grateful to you for saving our asses so many times. <laughs> and for anyone interested, I've just dropped the story, Timur the Furnish <sighs> Troll, in the uh, chat because Amazing. I found it years ago and I was like, the fuck is this? <laughs> okay, we go. gotta wrap up. Um shout out to Fish for help with the questions. Thank you so yes. much, Fish. Thank you, Queen, for your help. Queen's also been behind the scenes helping Ash for everything. Ash for everything you do. And thank you, Harlan, for creating this show that we all love. Thank you, Ren. Not only have you been so instrumental and so helpful in all the panels in so much this weekend and this, uh, but you have meticulously uh, you know, uh, collected the questions and asked people for questions and done all this. So huge, huge fucking applause for you. MVP, Ren. Uh, can I get an eight ball? Yes, you can get an eight ball. Absolutely. You can get this one. Hummus. <laughs> yes. It. Oh, it didn't come up. <laughs> Hummus didn't come up on its own, but it came up now. There you uh, go. Perfect. Okay. So. Let's run down everything that is happening this weekend. I know uh, right after this is Jackbox with Shamers and Great Old Ones. Yes, um, if you're a Shamer or a Great Old One, head to that channel. We'll be there shortly. Um, and then tomorrow, games for sure. There's still spots open for games. So you can go to the Warhorn and see what still has open spots. Listen, you're never going to find a better place to dip your toe into gaming if you've never role played before this is your chance it's everybody in the discord can tell you you know if you're feeling nervous if you're feeling intimidated this is a community that is so welcoming and supportive and like truly can't recommend enough um 100 taking yeah. that leap this weekend um and then panels Tomorrow at 10 a.m., I'm hosting Ask a Pro, which people submitted questions for that. And we're going to get deep into uh, life as a full-time creative. And Trin's going to be there. Shout out, Trin. I think you're, yeah, you're in the chat yeah. right now. Um, and then Saturday at 2.30 p.m., fan artist Mad Libs with Danny and uh, Stuff and Such and Miramo. And that is going to be very chaotic and silly and fun. I'm really, really looking forward to that one. Me too. And then Sunday at 11 a.m., also really looking forward to this uh, randomly generated panel. We have a list of 100 topics and three panelists. The higher they roll, they'll get questions like, what's your favorite childhood toy? The lower they roll, they'll get questions like, explain everything you know about the French Revolution or... Oh, no. um, yeah, one of my favorites uh, is the void is hiring. Explain your credentials to the void. <laughs> That's good. So that those are all going to be very, very excellent panels. Um, and I hope to see you all there in the chat. Absolutely. Artist Alley is also open right now. So go check it out immediately. Some amazing artists are there. Content, uh, or sorry, the costume contest is still going. Minecraft server is open all weekend. So jump on. I'm going to be playing a lot. And uh, yeah, Patreons at the Shamer tier and higher. Uh, we're going to be jumping on pretty much right now for some Jackbox. So uh, hope we get to see you. Yep. Yes, I'm opening up Artist Alley right now. Brilliant. I think Joe just did it, but oh, she nodded at me, but you're good either way. I think that's it from us, right, Ren? Yes, I think that's it. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone, for paying attention and listening, and see you on Victus Count, and see you soon. Bye. Bye.